Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this week's edition of the Thursday Talk webinars on DME for Peace. Just in case you've forgotten, my name is Jack Farrell and I am the DME for Peace project manager at Search for Common Ground. Now today I'm really excited to be kicking off our series on digital adaptation and technological innovation in peace building. In light of COVID-19, there is a need for practitioners across the peace building development and humanitarian nexus to embrace technology as a means to both build peace and create enduring change. Our day-to-day -day work is changing and we are slowly adapting to these new realities. And as these new, new realities set in, we face many challenges, including how, how do we adapt our programming to a changing socially distant world? And despite the all-consuming nature of the global health crisis, our work continues. And our, as a result, we, we need to find adaptive solutions. The purpose of this series is to help you and your organization do that. While this is a significant challenge, there are many bright spots from our field, and we are already seeing practitioners and organizations innovate to continue their work in the midst of the global health crisis. Over the next three months, DME for Peace, in partnership with today's guest buildup, will be bringing practical guidance to the field on how to use digital tools to adapt programming, how to develop online learning programs, how to effectively facilitate online discussions, showcase remote data collection tools, and highlight pro programmatic innovations in our field. So with that, let's get started with today's webinar. I'm delighted to welcome Julie Hawk and Maud Morrison of Build Up to the Thursday Talks. Julie and Maud are going to lead a discussion on setting the scene, a framework for the functions of technology and peace building. Just a note, if you have a question during the webinar, you can write it on the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard and we will address it once we reach the questions and answers. I'm now going to hand over to today's guests, Julie and Maud. It is wonderful to have you on the Thursday Talks. Feel free to take it away when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jack. So Maud and I are here. I thought we'd first just introduce Build Up really briefly for those of you who may not know who we are. Build Up transforms conflict in the digital age. We do this by combining best practices, participatory methodologies, and digital technologies to identify and address emergent challenges to peace, which are often tech related. We use digital technologies to build peace. We support peace innovators across the globe, working with local organizations to design and implement technology interventions for peace building processes that address divisions in society. And we also transform conflicts that happen in digital spaces by conducting research and interventions to address polarization on social and digital media in contexts across the globe. Uh, we also develop policy and research around these issues and where we know many of you from is that we host this global community of practice around peace and technology that we convene annually at the Build Peace Conference, um, which we hope to see many of you at this year. It'll be in Cape Town and online. So that's a little bit about Build Up. We've been developing through, this, through the years this framework for the functions of technology and peace building as we encounter them in our own practice and the practice of those that we work with. But I first want to start with just a quick definition of what is definition or what is innovation. This is the general definition that we like to use in our work, using something new or something known, but in a different way, a different time or a different place. It's still quite a general definition of quite a general concept. So we like to think about the different ways in which something can be innovative. And on this point, there's sort of two important things to note. One is that innovation does not require technology. There are creative innovations too, a couple of which that we'll show you through examples in this webinar. And innovation doesn't have to be all new. It can be an old method done in a new way. In the picture here on this slide, uh, you'll see a participatory video process that we were a part of. Participatory video is a great example of using an old tech, video cameras, in this new way that creates more access and inclusion um, for those being involved in the process. Um, also of note, innovation can be both a product or a process, and innovation can be external or facing the public or your beneficiaries, or it can be internal, changing how you do things inside of your organization. So that's our working definition of innovation. But what do we mean by digital innovation? When we say digital innovation, 
we're focusing on making use of digital technologies, which are tools, systems, or devices that generate, store, and process information. That includes a lot of things, as you can imagine, chatbots, text messages, radio, film, websites, social media, games, apps, augmented reality, virtual reality, satellites, even drones. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but we wanna give you a sense that there are a lot of possibilities out there. And if you're thinking already that some of these, you know, would work better than others in your context, um, we agree. Um, you've got to assess what technologies are suitable for your target group, for your goals, um, and for your context. So to summarize briefly on innovation, digital technologies are tools, systems, or devices that generate, store, and process data. Sometimes when we talk about innovation, people will automatically think of building an app, designing a new website, or coding a special technology tool. And this is sometimes where you get into the problem of people thinking that they can solve the COVID crisis with an app or solve you know, X crisis with a new website. Um, but creating these new types of products are only one type of innovation. Sometimes we can use existing tools that aren't particularly innovative in themselves, but use them in a new way. So whether innovation is a product or a process, it can be focused on influencing people externally or in changing how you do things internally at your organization. And we've seen that some of the most successful innovations are actually internal to an organization, creating opportunities uh, for us to increase the efficiency and the impact of our work. You'll see in the definitions here on this slide, um, often how we're thinking of these is that many of these innovations center around new ways of communicating and new ways of connecting. And that seems to be a common thread through these different types of innovation. Okay, so what technologies can we use to build peace? I gave you a long list of um, possible digital technologies that are out there. Take a moment to just think of all the technologies that you can, maybe on top of the list that I already said. We've seen some of these technologies, um, we've seen all of these technologies being used in different contexts for peace building, drones, satellites, bots, text messages, radio, et cetera, as I mentioned in the list before. And for us, low tech is as good as high tech. So if if you're thinking of AI and blockchain and, and some of these technologies, also add to your list SMS and radio, um, these low tech realities that are, are just as good and fit the purposes um so there's a lot of possibilities out there for what technologies can be used and we just want to highlight that there's functions that drive the solutions um in that we we should have a strategic purpose when we're choosing a technology to adapt into our peace building um, portfolio or projects and and mod will talk more about functions in just a moment as well before we get there though um, while we've seen all of these things, all of these different technologies being used to build peace, we don't think technology is just a tool, which is an adage you'll commonly hear and an adage that we used to say, frankly. Um, we don't think that technology is inherently positive. It does not automatically lead to positive social change. In fact, we pay careful attention to the many negative violent uses of technology, we often ask ourselves, is digital technology creating the conditions for more polarization, discord, and eventually violence? Or do digital technologies offer new and exciting ways to connect, find common ground, and work towards positive, positive social change? We know from experience, as you probably know from intuition, that both are possible. And we'll be sharing examples in this webinar of how the latter is true. But we don't think that it's just a matter of how we use technology. In other words, although it is useful to understand the functions that technology can play as a tool to build peace, we recognize that technology is just a, is not just a tool, which is to say it's it's not neutral. And we acknowledge that in some contexts, the relationship between digital technology and social change is very problematic. A technology stops being just a neutral tool when it fundamentally alters the human experience, which we're seeing um, through our own research and, and external research. Um, it's beginning to show that digital technologies are changing our incentives, affecting how we construct discourse, and altering how we build our identities. Um, 
these elements of technology is something that we as peace builders have to have open eyes about and can't sort of go in blindly thinking that tech is the answer. Okay, so why innovation for peace building? Our core belief is that real social change is only possible when everyone can participate in the change and when all groups are included. So peace building processes require participation and inclusion to be impactful. And digital and creative innovations can enhance participation and inclusion in peace building processes, making them more impactful. So that's why we're interested in digital technologies, because we think that one, inclusion is essential part of peace building, and we've seen how digital creative technologies can increase, can increase participation and inclusion. And the reflection on the point earlier about technology tooling us does not negate that digital technologies and innovation can be used as tools to build peace. And we've seen this concretely, and we're about to share some examples of the way that that is true. Um, but we believe that this peace building process is really only possible when everyone can participate and um, we increase that inclusion as, as best as we can. So now Maud's going to talk about some of the functions of technology for social cohesion, which is really where the framework that we've promised to share um, begins to come to light. Thanks, Julie. Um, can you hear me all okay? Yeah. Cool. So thanks for that intro and thanks so much to everybody for joining and for Jack um, for having us. Really excited to share this with you. Um, so from our work at Build Up, um, working on the ground with different organizations and actors, we have identified three core functions um, for the way that we think technology can support social cohesion. And as Julie mentioned, we're interested in this framework because we really want to um, avoid this idea that technology is the solution um, and focus on the idea that technology is interesting to us when it's driving towards a very specific purpose. And this framework is something we've been working on for a long time um, and that we are iterating constantly. And at the end of the session today, I want to share with you a bit about what we're thinking um, and how our thinking is developing even as we speak on this framework. Um, but the basics of it are, are fairly constant. So we divide um, the functions of technology into three main buckets, uh, data management, strategic communications, and dialogue and networking. And to illustrate this framework, I'm gonna just go into some examples for each of these. I'm going to run through the examples quite quickly, but we can come back and share more detail on any of them as we go. So starting with data management, we think that, and we are seeing that technology can, can be really interesting when it supports uh, new ways to gather, analyze, and visualize data about peace and conflict. And this is particularly important to us at Build Up because we know that data work in conflict and peace building does have sometimes have a tendency to be quite extractive and technology can, can really give us interesting ways to address that challenge. So the first example I'm gonna share with you is from Sudan, a project uh, one of our colleagues worked on a long time ago, but it's still going, it's run by a local NGO. And this is a fairly sort of um, straightforward in the sense that it's a communication system that collects and disseminates information about livelihoods, peace and conflict um, to communities along migratory routes. And the system uses a combination of crowd seizing, crowd seeding, crowd sourcing, and receiving reports from the public, both from the general public through SMS and also from kind of selected trusted reporters as well as from call-ins to a radio show. Um, and what's really nice about this system is one that it's run really on low-tech SMS systems, which as Julie shared is something we really, we really care about um, because they are, it's very contextually relevant. And also there's a really great feedback loop in this system. So um, the data is not only gathered from more people by putting this out in an accessible way to the public, but it's also shared regularly back to that public. So there is a really strong um, feedback loop in the data, which again gets over some of that extractive data work that we have seen. Um, so that's 
the first example. The second example I want to share is falls in the, the bucket of gathering different data. Um, this is a project that BuildUp actually ran in, back in 2015 in the Central African Republic. Um, we were asked to support a nationwide consultation on the process of disarmament. And the way we did it is we ran open creative spaces, open art spaces to, to provide an opportunity for people in the community to share their perspectives and their experience. They did that through film, as you can see in the picture here, but also through art, um, drawing, telling stories and writing. And this was interesting because it allowed us to gather data from groups of people who would not traditionally be involved in consultation processes. So this, over the course of a month, we gathered over 3,000. Um, we had over 3,000 participants, um, almost 600 pieces of content were produced, and this was then shared in a national exhibition. Um, and later that exhibition went on tour. So this is really about getting more data, a different kinds of data from a larger set of people. And the final example in the category of data management is a program that one of our Peace Innovator fellows worked on in Burundi. And this is about really analyzing data in a new way. So this was um, set up and designed by a local NGO called Senap. They conducted a quantitative survey of young people's views of the future of Burundi. But what was innovative here is instead of having their researchers analyze data and produce a report, Senap decided to actually publish the data on an online interactive platform that you can see here. And the platform is designed for anyone, even those without any data background at all, to explore the answers to different questions and come to their own conclusions about the data. And this platform was actually used to bring young people and policymakers together to discuss the data. So it was also used as a kind of hook for dialogue. And this participatory approach to analysis enabled by very simple technology is, I think, um, a really great example and something we've been uh, replicating in several other contexts at the moment as well. So that's the sort of first bucket. We're interested in technologies for data management, when they can help us gather new or different information, analyze that information in new ways, um, and visualize it and make it more accessible to more people. So then we move on to strategic communications, which is often um, the thing that is most familiar to many people working in peace building and often where they are already using some form of technology or social media. We're interested in technologies that can engage more or different people in conversations about peace. So the first example I want to share with you is from one of our local peace innovators in Myanmar, Mido. Um, they, work, they work on promoting media literacy and fact checking. And um, together with us, they developed a messenger chatbot to promote media literacy in Myanmar. And you can see an image from that chatbot on, on your screens. And the chatbot also provides a fact checking and verification function, but also provides basic content on media literacy in a very accessible format for a large number of people. And this is really important in a place like Myanmar where media literacy is very closely tied to conflict issues and also where misinformation is a real challenge. And actually, it's been really great to see Mido have adapted their work um, to the COVID-19 response and are now using the chatbot to correct misinformation about COVID-19. So this is a really great example of technology enabling a new kind of information sharing. The second example is from Syria, um, one of the organizations that we've worked with through our Digital Steps program, which runs in Syria, an organization called Bibisaka. They're a youth initiative and they use animation to promote um, nonviolence and nonviolent narratives for young people in the country. So not only do they disseminate these through Facebook and through social media, um, in, in quite an innovative way, but they also use these videos and these animations to 
prompt dialogue with young people, both offline dialogue and also online dialogue. Um, and so here they are using strategic communications to challenge existing narratives, to create new narratives, and really to promote a, um, uh, a new form of dialogue and connections with young people. And then I'm going to move on to the next example, which is back to Myanmar. Um, I have some bias, it seems, in my examples, <laughs> but um, this is one of our, uh, also one of our local peace innovators or someone that ran through our peace innovator program, which we ran in Myanmar last year. This is an organization from Southeast Myanmar. They're a grassroots youth organization that work to empower and connect young people with each other and with uh, policymakers. And they set up a um, Facebook campaign called Common Imagination, which they use to mobilize young people in the community around a common and peaceful vision for their future. So the Common Imagination page is based on videos created by young people in their, in their community and Seed for Myanmar actually trains those young people on video making. When I say video making, I mean video making on mobile. So it's something that's very accessible to young people and positive messaging approaches as well. And then those young people went out into their communities and made videos um, about local challenges um, in their area. And those videos formed the basis of this campaign. And they actually used these videos um, to prompt dialogue between young people, so on the Facebook page and also in offline um, meetings. But they also used it to engage with local government and other key stakeholders. And they actually had quite a bit of a success in mobilizing local governments in a way that they hadn't had before. So this is quite an interesting use of strategic communications, not only to connect people at the grassroots, but to mobilize and catalyze that connection up to a higher level. So in terms of strategic communications, these are the things we're interested in. And again, these examples are really designed to be illustrative. Um, there are so many more that we could have shared. We're interested in technologies here that can enable information sharing, that also can enable voice, so more or different people can express their opinions effectively and exert influence. And we're also interested in technologies that can help create new narratives or debunk harmful ones. So those are the first two buckets. And our final kind of category within this framework is to look at dialogue and networking, creating new spaces for people to come together, to connect and to organize around peace. So here, um, the first example I want to share with you is from Colombia. It's also um, comes out of our Peace Innovators program, um, our very first version of that program, which was back in 2016. This is an in initiative um, that was developed for the city of Medellin, which is, as many of you know, um, a conflict one of the most conflict affected cities in Colombia. The city runs a participatory budget process. So this allows people um, in Medellin to actually have a role in expressing their priorities for spending on public services at the local level. But the participatory budget process, although it exist, was, existed, was not particularly engaging for people. So what this organization did, Polycentrico, is they created a game that allowed citizens to deliberate and engage in the participatory budgeting process in a, in a more exciting way. And this was um, really great because it immediately made, um, made people want to get involved in the process and made it much more engaging. And this game was then used as a catalyst for greater connections between the citizens and the local authorities. And I'm going to hand back to Julie because the next two examples she was directly involved in. So I think it will be uh, clearer coming directly from her. So Julie, thank you. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so in this example, this is a, 
um, an interesting way of thinking about doing dialogue at scale. This is the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange Program project. It's a um, implemented by a consortium of eight different organizations, which include uh, the Sharing Perspectives Foundation, who I'm involved with, Solia, Search for Common Ground, and several others. It uses a methodology of virtual exchange, which is this interesting mix between global education, online learning, and peace building, to enable sustained online dialogue centered around key socio-political issues and divides. So um, at the Sharing Perspectives Foundation, where I'm involved, where I'm involved, we've centered these around in 2015. It was around the refugee crisis. It's currently centered around populism. We address issues of nationalism and essentially bringing young people together to talk with each other instead of about each other on on these key sort of divisive issues. And this is a project that's reaching thousands of participants at a time um, that are able to engage in these intercultural dialogue opportunities, though still in these um, organized in these small groups that are guided by trained facilitators. So this is a way that um, technology is really enabling um, yeah, dialogue at scale in interesting ways. Um, another version of online dialogue is a project that we um, ran and are running at Build Up. Uh, the Commons is something we've presented about before, so this may be a repeat to some of you. It's a project based in the United States. Um, it identifies people engaged in political conversations on Twitter and Facebook in the US. It analyzes what kinds of behaviors may uh, denote a person being exposed to polarizing narratives or dynamics, and it targets these people with automated, um, uh, with a technology support to human facilitators who then contact these people and invite them into conversations about bridging divides. Uh, this is something that we ran for a couple of years in the US and are currently looking how to adapt it here and elsewhere as well. But it's a method of um, reaching unusual suspects online and really targeting them intentionally and deliberately. Um, yeah, and one that I think really pushes uh, what the borders are of being able to engage with anger and conflict in online spaces. Thanks, Julie. Um, so again, I, I feel like we really ran through those examples, but the idea was just to illustrate this framework, which you'll see in front of you, which divides these, um, these functions, these three main functions into further categories. So on the data management, you have these gather, analyze, and visualize. And then we talk a little bit more about what specifically we think that technology can help us to do. And again, to sort of the risk of re-emphasizing a point, it's not that we think necessarily that technology will say facilitate representation in political processes, but that if used in, in, a, in a careful way and if designed in a, in a really innovative way, then there are opportunities for these things to happen. So, and yeah, so I mentioned at the beginning that we are constantly adapting and evolving our thinking on this and that comes a lot out of conversations like this one where we we are forced to reassess where we are and you know what the trends are in conflict and particularly in digital elements of conflict. So Julie mentioned at the beginning that um, we've been thinking a lot about how technology is tooling us um, not only a tool that we can use but it's actually affecting us and it's affecting conflict dynamics in a significant way. And so our latest thinking, and again, this is not something we have um, presented or really developed in, in much detail yet, but we are thinking that actually, how can we apply this framework, which has focused predominantly on the positive potential of technology to some of that negative potential of technology as well? So how could those functions map on to the ways in which technology exacerbates conflict or division? So to give you an example, um, let's take data management. Um, we can see those positive uses that I've just outlined, but we can also see technology being used for privacy and surveillance, for example, in ways that are exacerbating divisions or creating new divisions. This is something that coronavirus has brought up or brought into new light, I think. So that bucket of data management applies equally for negative uh, uses of technology. 
And similarly, when it comes to strategic communications, you know, the issues of hate speech, disinformation, misinformation, these are all things that we've known about for a long time and are again being brought to the fore in the current pandemic. And really a lot of the tools we use for strategic communications are being equally used for these um, potentially harmful applications. And then finally, when it comes to dialogue and networking, we're facing or thinking a lot about the challenges of polarization, online polarization, and the way that social media networks are structured to enable um, or reflect societal divisions. And as well as we're also thinking about that recruitment into violence challenge, that connection and, and mobilization of people on online. And so these tools that we're talking about for dialogue and networking are, have direct counterparts um, in, the, in the catalyst of division. So none of these challenges are new, um, but we are beginning to think about how we can incorporate some of these ways that technology is tooling us into this functions framework and i think we'd love to hear more from you on that and and gauge your reactions to it so yeah julie do you want to share about um yeah. the next slide yeah yeah so we'd love to um have some time to answer questions but before we get there we actually have a request for those of you tuning in um, in light of COVID and people having to adapt quickly their programs, um, we were just getting a lot of calls essentially from friends and people on our network um, asking how to do this. Um, we're actually working on a set of free introductory online courses to help uh, peace building initiatives adapt to these current challenges and ongoing needs. Um, and these courses are very practical and actionable how-to guides. Uh, there's eight that we have slotted and we'd really like your feedback on what you um, would like to see first, what would be most useful to you. So if you go to this link bit.ly slash digital adaptations, um, you can vote essentially on and, and rank your priorities for the order in which these courses will come out through this year. Um, so we'd be excited to hear your thoughts there and then adapt our offering accordingly. Yeah, and thank you so much for this opportunity to share more about our work. And yeah, we'd love to take some questions while we still have time. Great. Thank you very much, Julie and Maud, for a great presentation. I'm going to make sure to put the link to the bit.ly um, in the chat function so that everybody who's on today's webinar can go and uh, share their insights. Uh, I really appreciate your points on uh, uh, the technological sort of the Silicon Valley solutionism. Um, we probably cannot solve the world's problems through a new app. Or is it the right time in a, in a global economic crisis to ask your donors uh, for $150,000 to build a new app? Um, so I think it's it's important for people online to think about that. And then when, you, when we're talking about innovation, um, I, I think it was a great point you guys made about innovation doesn't necessarily mean new technology, like for example, applying blockchain or machine learning to your context. Um, mm -hmm. that innovation is context specific um, and that can be it can be applying existing solutions to, to new problems and, and new contexts. And then just uh, on your uh, mentioning of the Erasmus Virtual Exchange Program, uh, we uh, sort of, I work for Search for Common Ground, so we hope to have Celia and uh, Uni Collaboration on in the next couple of weeks to host a couple of sessions on online facilitation and uh, digital training development. Uh, so it should be pretty uh, exciting. Uh, to our audience, uh, thank you for your patience. This is now your time to shine. Uh, a couple of notes about our format for those of you who are unfamiliar or new to the Thursday Talks. You could submit a question in two ways. The first is through the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, which will allow you to type your question. The second is the click on the hand icon. That will raise your hand and allow us to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question live. When you do submit your question, we ask that you submit your name and affiliation. Just a note, these talks are recorded and posted on Demi Fries' media gallery. So those who are not able to join us at this time can go back and listen to the presentation and the discussion. Now, Julia Mon, I'm going to use my moderator's privilege um, to, to ask the first question. Um, and I know you mentioned a number of projects that stem from this, but could you provide a bit more background on your Peace Innovators program? Is this done on a national, regional, international level? Yeah. yeah. Leave that to you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I did. I did mention it a number of times because um, 
we we use the number of examples that came out of that program. So the Peace Innovators program is um, a kind of a title for what is actually a number of different programs and projects, but they all fall under this um, bracket of Peace Innovators. That program is designed to support um, peace builders already working on the ground um, and who want to bring technology into their work and who want to bring this kind of innovative approach into the work that they're already doing as a way to increase their impact or to reach um, you know the next level of their work so what we do is we select um, local organizations or local initiatives from different places depending on where our projects are currently running and we provide them with mentorship and accompaniment over the course of a year or two years in order to actually um, help them design and test through the launch of a pilot a technology tool or process so a lot of the examples that i shared came out of that accompaniment and mentorship model and um, just to give you a geographic sense we're currently running that program in syria um, both inside yemen and with yemeni diaspora communities we've just launched um, this week a program in the sahel region burkina faso niger and mali and I um, think that's everywhere that we're running it now, but we have previously run it in Myanmar. We've also had fellows in Colombia, uh, Burundi, Pakistan, and Bosnia, to name a few. So, yeah, and there's plenty more information. Maybe we can link uh, the page on our website in the chat and happy to answer more questions. Great. Thank you, Maud. Um, our next question comes from Jenny Ireland. And Jenny writes, has or will BuildUp made any changes themselves to their work because of the COVID-19 context? That's a great question and we have to laugh because yes, <laughs> while, a lot, <laughs> while a lot of our work was already designed to be digital, um, sort of, you know, as, as the crisis was really ramping up, we had people in, we had people in Yemen, we had someone halfway to Mozambique, we you know, all sort of had to gather quickly back to our bases and then we adapted several of our trainings and programs to move online. Um, so we, you know, uh, ran a couple of, couple of our workshops online. We're, we're also running a consultation processes even over WhatsApp. So we have had to adapt really quickly in the different areas we work into. Great, thank you, Julie. Um, our next question comes from Ted Perlmutter. And Ted writes, how does the need for new technology fit in with the fact that the possibilities for local organizations to gain greater autonomy as representatives of international organizations can no longer travel and supervise as closely? Um, so I think what Ted is trying to ask here is just, um, does um, sort of the absence of international actors and their inability to travel provide local organizations and local practitioners with an opportunity to sort of to sort of uh, assume more responsibility. And maybe that's through technology. Yeah. I think that's an amazing question um, and really interesting. Julie, maybe I can start and then you can add. Because um, I think one of the things that is becoming very clear is it's, um, I would say, it may not be um, replacing international organizations but it's certainly highlighting the need and the absolute value of locally led um, innovation and local actors on the ground and i think that's something that we've been seeing for a long time particularly when it comes to digital innovation it's often the local actors who design the most sustainable uses and applications of technology which is why most of the examples we shared actually were locally designed um, by local actors and I think that's becoming even more clear now, um, as a lot of people are really adapting in really innovative ways um, on the ground. A lot of our partners are doing that. And I think the role that we can play um, as an organization like BuildUp really has to be in the accompaniment and the facilitation of their design processes. So providing some inputs like the courses that Julie mentioned that enable them to actually scale up these adaptations more quickly on the ground. But Julie, feel free to add something. The only thing I'd add, and I think that's spot on, the only thing I'd add is that there is a risk for 
um, the reification of the same power dynamics currently because larger international organizations have uh, just more resources and access to um, yeah, creating tech solutions that might then draw resources away from where it's needed most and where we know it's most effective, which is in these local adaptations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys, uh, and thank you for a great question, Ted. Um, our next question actually comes from quite a few people, um, including Lynn Hagvist, uh, who works for UN Women, as well as Patience Chiradza. Um, and they're asking if you could provide more example, uh, more more context and more information about your example of, of working in Sudan and whether or not the project is still ongoing. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we actually included that project is because it is still ongoing um, and that's been going on for many years. I can't remember exactly when um, our director Elena was involved in it, but it's a long time ago. Um, over five years ago and it's still going strong. So it's, um, I think, exactly to the previous point that a lot of these adaptations um, are strong because they're designed locally and adapted locally. And the other thing, the other reason I think it's been so sustainable is because it is so um, low tech and it is so participatory in the sense of the feedback loops. Um, so communities, anyone that submits an SMS to the system receives a regular report back on conflict dynamics and on incidents that have been reported in their area. And the, I, the other reason I think it's been so sustainable is because it's very simple. Um, it, it's not flashy. It doesn't um, try to do too much. It's just a really simple and effective um, communication solution. So yeah, I, I think it's um, it's, it, you know, if you contrast that with the number of early warning systems that have been developed and not sustained, I think it's quite stark. And that's why I really wanted to start with that example and lead with it. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, but I want to round up with one final question. Um, a lot of our audience today are calling in from conflict affected contexts uh, where internet penetration might be might be great um, and obviously uh, digital technology and adapting digitally uh, is, is a skill that or is a is a tool that not all of us have access to so do you have any advice for any of the practitioners listening right now that uh, are hoping to um, apply digital technology uh, in communities where access to technology is low or any general advice on adaptation um, in that regard? I think I can give one, and maybe that's just a challenge to the question there of access to certain technologies might be low, but access to probably the most important technologies for whatever context you're in, you know, you probably have it. Um, there's a great sort of overarching peace building principle of meeting people where they are. And we just find the same to be true when we're talking about technical adaptation. If people are having these discussions on WhatsApp, stay on WhatsApp. If they're doing it on Facebook, stay on Facebook. You know, these are tools that most people do have access to. If they're using SMS, use that. Maude, would you add to that as well? <laughs> no, I would. Uh, my suggestion was going to be use what people are already using. And so that's exactly the same point. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the digital nativism um, aspect and the familiarity is key. Um, my own two cents from this from working with a number of organizations who are trying to um, adapt digitally right now is introducing a, a new app just increases uh, the number of barriers that people have to sort of overcome to participate. Um, you want to make it as easy as possible and you want to work within the context you're working. Um, so um, I, I think that uh, there are so many solutions out there that we can tap into and use um, for example, if digital technology, um, if your access to digital technology might be great, um, as uh, Julie and Maude highlighted, you know, SMS and phone surveys are, are still uh, hugely important and hugely effective. Mm -hmm. um, being able to utilize the technology that people have access to is a way around that. Um, and yeah, innovation doesn't have to be something brand new and shiny, it, it can be anything. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, uh, well, guys, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation and discussion. And um, thank you to our audience for, for joining us. Um, this recording will be posted online on our media gallery later today. So please feel free to return to it and share it with your colleagues. Uh, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks with another webinar. Um, we have a bunch of webinars coming over the next three months. I hope to see you all there and take part. Um, the link that Julie mentioned is in your chat box right now. Um, we'll tweet it out on the DMA for Peace uh, Twitter later today. Um, but please feel free to, to log in and, and share your insights with the team. Um, and yeah, thank you all for, uh, for joining. Thank you again to Julie and Maud. Um, I hope you all have a, a restful and safe rest of your week. And I'll see you online in the not too distant future. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everybody.